Hello, and welcome to episode 13 of the American Years podcast. I'm Kate Simpson, coordinator of the American Years project. Our project is creating space for and recording the many stories and memories of all the people whose lives are intrinsically linked to the American Navy's presence in the Holy Lock by Danoon on the west coast of Scotland. In this episode, we talk to board member Terry. Terry talks about life and routines aboard the USS Hunley AS-31, his career in the Navy, and how he ultimately came to be a member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. I was in the Navy for four years. Uh, When I joined the Navy at the age of 19, I never had any intention of staying in the Navy any longer than four years. And in retrospect, I consider myself to have been a social and economic conscript. I was in boat operations. Uh, I was an engineman. And the thing that I remember uh, most about uh, Site 1 Holy Lock Scotland are the sounds that you would hear. And for me, the soundtrack of my memories there is the sound of a Detroit diesel engine, boom, 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 and the boats, because I was there on the pontoons and uh, in the rain. And then uh, the boat dispatcher would come out and he would say, uh, Arden Adam, 50 footer, load them up. And a whole bunch of guys would file aboard the 50 footer and then it was time to shove it off. And I'd untie the, the stern line and untie the bow line and we'd shove off for Arden Adam to and fro. And we did that a lot all day long and two days in a row at the weekends. About the sounds of the Holy Lock, Down on the pontoons, uh, about two stories up, was the brow. And that was a steel bridge that was uh, subjected to the the wind and the weather. You would have hundreds of guys go uh, charging across that bridge at 4 o'clock because it was shuttles. And they'd all be wanting to get on a Liberty boat to get to Arden Adam to to call it a day. It's the sounds that I can remember the best. Uh, mm-hmm. And the engines, you know, uh, they'd be starting up. <laughs> that there. And, brum, 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 that there. And, and all young guys <laughs> having a great time cutting donuts, you know. <laughs> Nobody was looking. You cut a you know, full, full speed ahead, you know, full reverse and really ringing them out. <laughs> well, it seemed to rain a lot, didn't it? Summertimes it was beautiful. When it wasn't raining, the view was stunning. And it was always changing. And in the rain, it was cold and wet. And it got, it rained so much that I walked into the barge one time and somebody asked me, is it raining outside? And I really had no idea (laughs) if it was still raining. Because we worked in the rain a lot. So you just said yes. I stood there like an idiot looking at myself. I'm wet, but is it raining out there? I don't know. (laughs) It just seemed bizarre, a bizarre question. (laughs) <laughs> something you mentioned about shove off you know to go you know the boat as off to the deck we had a bullhorn and we had to stand there every time and say like on the mic eight shove off make our net appear and return to the ship because if we didn't tell them that they didn't have to <laughs> legally come back so we had to tell them to return to the ship you know you shove off the box they'll shove off make cardwell bay and then from mm-hmm. there they could go to carlisle and london and whatever you know if I had known that at the time, <laughs> I would have, I'd have fueled it up and we would have headed south. <laughs> what was the best part of your job, other than the rain, obviously? Well, the best part of my job was being 19 with all your friends and having a great adventure. <laughs> Where had you moved from originally? I come from Staten Island, New York. I came over here with about eight guys that I was close to. We had been through boot camp together and we had been through apprentice training together and Every one of them got married, except for the guy who was already married. We arrived on uh, Presswick Airport in March of 1982 on a Northwest Orient, and we were met uh, by the I-Division bus, which was driven up the Ayrshire coast with a combination of recklessness and skill by a guy who looked like he was from the 1970s with bell bottoms and long hair. And uh, we got to the Western Ferry uh, the moment it was about to take off, and uh, the boat took off into the din. We couldn't see anything. So uh, there was a fellow on board the bus told us that the submarine base is out there somewhere. Uh, because of the fog, we couldn't see it. We eventually uh, got onto a Liberty boat, and we still couldn't see the, the Holy Lock submarine base until we were about 100 feet away, and we were all craning our necks to look out the window to see what it looked like. We couldn't. 
we couldn't see it in the gray, but it, it began to take shape. You know, and that was my first view with the submarine base. Uh, it was up close and personal. And right away, uh, we checked into S2, which was uh, on the Hunley. And uh, I spent uh, three straight months working the night shift in the galley before I went to boat operations. Oh, that must have been hard. Man, it wasn't hard when you're 19 and everything's a great adventure. <laughs> Puts hair on your chest. Well, it did, yes. But we used to work port and starboard, two duty sections, so you only had two weekends off a month. Uh, you basically worked uh, 32 hours uh, on duty and uh, 16 hours off. So after a while, you did want to go out and uh, blow off a little bit of steam. Uh, as it happens in boat operations, we were also in two duty sections. De noon to blow off steam or up to Glasgow? I usually de noon, uh, the closest bar. I say it was the Harmony. <laughs> Or, or to Paul Jones. I was told to stay out of the Paul Jones, so that's where we went. <laughs> Must be a good place. <laughs> stay out of there. <laughs> During the time you were here, did you go back to America? No. No, I, I was here uh, for about two years, and uh, then uh, I was transferred to a destroyer out of Charleston. So uh, the time that I was stationed here, I didn't go back to visit the United States. I, I went to Ireland a couple of times because I have relatives in Ireland. So but that, that was a lot of fun, you know, getting leave and going to Ireland. See that bus that picked you up at Presswick Airport mm -hmm. from 1983 to 85 for two and a half years. That's I was the I division officer. That was my job. Right. The best two and a half years of the Navy was I loved that job. Bell bottoms and long hair, eh, Charlie? Did you know who that name? was? Because we wore our uniforms. Our oh. There was a guy named Sickles, was the Russ, officer. Russ and Susie Sickles, my good friend, lives in Corning, New York. I go see him every time I go to the States. And there was another fellow named Jim Reason, who I knew very well. He worked chief, in the I Division. Yeah. The chief in charge at that time was Lee Reynolds. Right. I remember him. I can tell you about the day I saw a nuclear bomb. That was a really memorable day. Ooh. Anybody ever see a nuclear bomb? I have. I have. <laughs> well, uh, you'd be going up from boat operations across the brow, and uh, you salute the flag, and then you request permission to aboard the ship, and you better make sure you had a haircut because they would catch you at that point going to lunch. You'd be walking up the main deck on the, the starboard side, and there'd be all sorts of things happening. You know, imagine there's a chief in khakis, and he's a bosun mate, and he's involved in uh, in uh, crane operations, and they can't get the walkie-talkie to, uh, to work, so he's shouting up to the guy above him, right? And then there's a, another fellow, he's uh, doing welding, and there's a whole bunch of uh, people to and fro and doing their, their job and going about their business. And about midships, where I go into the into the ship, I look over and I see that the nearest submarine has the, the hatch open and the cap is off and I can see eight uh, Merv cones in there, you see? And I'm looking at them and I'm counting and I'm saying, holy Jesus, nuclear bombs, <laughs> right, right there in the flesh, right? And uh, there's a jarhead there about my age and outside they were, they were more heavily armed and he told me to get moving. I didn't like the way he said that, but <laughs> I got moving real quick because uh, there was this voice in the side of my head telling me to run. <laughs> so I go into lunch and uh, I, I eat at the salad bar, which I thought was pretty fascinating at the time. Um, I've just seen a nuclear bomb and now I'm going to eat at the salad bar. <laughs> I thought it was incongruous and uh, I enjoyed that very much. And then about 12.25, I would go to the chow line and get a whole bunch of sliders and uh, stick them in my pocket because it was the end of chow. And They'd be giving them all away, so uh, I fill my pockets with sliders and go back to boat operations where it was safe. <laughs> what are sliders? sliders? Hamburgers. Yeah, now that's something that ought to really be mentioned is sliders, because uh, I worked mm. in the galley a lot, so I used to cook sliders, and they used to, we cook them on a rotisserie, very slow. After they were cooked, we would soak them in a big insert uh, full of beef broth, right? So when they were ready to eat, they would taste more like meat. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, yeah. Bon appetit. Uh, breakfast was the best meal in the Navy because uh, there were real eggs there and uh, real onions and real, well, the cheese wasn't up to much, but <laughs> breakfast was always the best meal. I can't say it because of my pure voice, but someone might be able to say what the official word for the sausage biscuits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the SOS. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anybody knows what we're talking about. Slop on shingle. <laughs> yeah. Ask something on the shingle. Look at the dictionary. It's it's actual, it's it's real. It's Man. a special word for it. It tasted it's, good. It should be real. It was a cream ground beef on toast. Yeah, lovely. I was going to ask you why you're still here. If you're here, how come you came back? I'm here. I'm in Hunter Street. <laughs> right. So how come you came back after you went off to do your time coming out of Charleston? Well, just like everybody else who was on that bus, we got married. <laughs> all right. right. There was something about that bus, that I division bus. We were all destined <laughs> to get married. So. <laughs> we didn't know it. <laughs> How many of the others on the I division bus that got married came back? It was just me who uh, come to live in Scotland. Uh, my children were born here in Scotland, you see. I don't know if you know what Staten Island's like, but it's not the nicest place in the world, you know? It's a, <laughs> it's, a it's a place, uh, it's overbuilt, uh, hasn't been planned, there's no urban planning, and it's underfunded and overcrowded and uh, noisy and full of traffic and... Uh, so it's not, it's not a nice place. But I didn't want my kids to grow up in the United States. I thought they would be better off here. For years, people would say to me, well, why are you living here? Why aren't you living in the United States? They would say that in the United States. They would say that here, you know? But, but they don't say it anymore. <laughs> I get that a lot. I, I still get that. You still get that? Yeah, from both sides. You know, what in the world are you doing here? You're from California? Did you tell them the place was on fire? Well, no, the grass is always greener. I don't care who you are. They watch Baywatch and they wonder, why would you leave Baywatch to live in, in the Cowell Peninsula? And you, you say, well, you know, that's not real life. Yeah. Um, and so. <laughs> the, weather's not, the weather's not conducive to a Baywatch situation over here. <laughs> no, no, it's not. And, and actually what people don't realize is that that Southern California, you know, the California current comes down from Alaska and the Bering Sea. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that water in California, even down in Los Angeles, is 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 really cold. Now, uh, it's not the Clyde. I'll give you that. The Clyde, um, you know, you, you put a, a, one of your ankles in the, in the Clyde, you're going to pull out an ice cube. Yeah, but there's a difference between asking what, what why on earth are you here and why are you here? Because people's stories are interesting and what brings them? It's, it's judgmental to say, what on earth, why on earth are you here? Why are you here? It's, it's a person's story, and that's always interesting. I tell them I used to work for the U.S. government in a sensitive capacity. <laughs> <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to see what I've seen. <laughs> Did you marry somebody from Dunoon? Yeah, uh, she's not from Dunoon. Uh, she's from Dumfries, uh, but she had been working in Dunoon. She was on a summer job from uh, from university, and then she decided not to go back to university and subsequently met me. Lucky girl. <laughs> yeah, I tell her that. <laughs> I'm going to go tell her now. <laughs> <laughs> what did yeah. you do after you left the Navy? I got out of the Navy and then I worked two jobs. I was a security guard part-time and I was a house painter during the day. I came up with as much money as I could. And uh, in September of 1986, I came back to Scotland. Well, when I first come back to Scotland, uh, my brother-in-law got me work uh, in Glasgow, working on a, with a crew as, uh, as a painter. So that went on for, quite, for, for a while, but not as long as uh, I needed it to. Mm -hmm. Let's see, after that, I actually got work at the submarine base in the summer of 1987. I had disguised myself as a Navy wife, you see, <laughs> I had a social security guard <laughs> job. And I was working at the, at the warehouse there for a fellow named uh, Grady Ulrich. 
I also worked on the submarine's uh, inventory and a whole bunch of supplies that were inside of the, in amongst the missile tubes. So I thought it was kind of funny, you know, they got to be, you know, got, a, <laughs> got somebody like me onto a submarine. <laughs> I was a civilian and a, a bit of a leftist that <laughs> I'm no fan of nuclear weapons. And there I was just working for about eight bucks an hour, <laughs> counting the supplies inside the, inside the, the submarine storage facilities. Uh, but there was lots of jobs that I did though. Uh, I worked at a care home. I was a handyman. I worked at a factory. I drove a taxi for a short time uh, uh, and I've been a carer quite a bit. And I worked at TSC for, for some time. Or this, that and the other job really. Mm -hmm. When you first came here, I mean, I know you were young and dumb, but was there anything particular about the difference between Scotland and, and America that just like, that struck you most? Well, what always gonna strike you is uh, the greenery, you know, cause uh, it's like a green riot. I'm actually an Irish American. And when we were youngsters, uh, we spent summers in Ireland. So uh, Scotland didn't come up, come as a great shock to me. Uh, what did surprise me was how long it took me to get used to the accent. Accent. Oh, the accent. All right. Yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a tough thing there. It took me many years of watching Chewing the Fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Still Game. Still Game. Do you not watch Still yeah, Game? Yes, Still Game as well. That's fantastic. Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. One of the it's funniest like... shows going ever. Yeah, uh -huh. it really is. Yeah. You you said you were a bit of a lefty. Did you ever protest the the nuclear weapons or anything? Uh, the most I ever did was join CND and give them a hundred bucks a year. Presumably after you left the navy. Yes, <laughs> that's, <laughs> only, that's only fairly recently. <laughs> I was only, a, but I've been a member of CND for a long time. Yeah, but it's only yeah. fairly recently I've been coughing up with any kind of real money. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the ex-military being CND. And let me have your social security number, could you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm also uh, joined a, a, an organization called Global Zero. If you ever heard of that one, Global Zero is about nuclear weapons, not 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 not, not, not sugar-free soft drinks. <laughs> I, I reached the conclusion about nuclear weapons, uh, and it came from that day. I I, I thought that. Uh, People who are dealing with nuclear weapons, if they knew what they were doing, uh, they wouldn't be doing it. Mm. Okay? So they can't possibly know what they're doing. That's a challenging theory for somebody who's been in the military. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You said you came to the conclusion on that day. Well, on that day, I, I thought about it since that day, you see, because I didn't know how to compute this. I only knew that I felt revolted. <laughs> You know, so kind of kind of scared and uh, uncomfortable and uh, all, all sorts of uh, feelings like negativity like that. It just took me a while to articulate that. I actually made a study of uh, of, of uh, uh, nuclear weapons, and that included the, the submarine base at the Holy Lock and uh, Anglo-American relations and that. Uh, but uh, if you if you study uh, nuclear, uh, you know, from the beginning uh, of Los Alamos up to the present day, uh, you know, you get fed up of reading about that stuff. You don't want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God. I've read a few of, uh, of those books you've lent me, and it's um, it's by pure chance that we haven't had more hellish type of accidents. We've had all kinds of accidents, haven't we? But none that have, that have really just been outright nuclear explosions. It's gobsmacking that there hasn't been more more devastation through through accidental um, knock on wood every day Philip. yeah that's right we'll do that <laughs> right now right now so i hear where you're coming from anyway i think the worst the worst of it is is that some modern thinking is to think that we can use them and somebody's going to win yeah, yeah. You know, there are no winners there will be no winners in nuclear strikes mm -hmm. <laughs> you have been listening to the american years you visited podcast huge thanks to terry for taking the time to share his experiences with us thank you for listening see you next time